And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters with Jason Tran. Thank you so much for joining us for our unique podcast community where we explore the triumphs and challenges of the performing arts world as seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Thank you so much for helping us grow. We hit 1,645 subscribers and we grow every day thanks to you. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube and, on YouTube and smash that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on our upcoming guests and topics. To see our over 225 past episodes, check out our website. They're all free in there at www.jasontram.net. You can also see our upcoming guests and all the really interesting topics we have coming up. We have some wonderful guests coming up from rock bands, indie rock artists, opera singers, pianists, concerto soloists, and everything in between. Here on Music Matters, we discuss the, art, the artistic banners of the day, and we love to just talk to different people and have these conversations. Our guest today is a renowned collaborative pianist, Mary Pinto, who is uh, quite active in New York City and New Jersey and the tri-state area. She coaches many of the finest opera singers in the world at places like the Metropolitan Opera and also teaches at Montclair State University. I've known her for many years. I'm so delighted she's here. Welcome, Mary. Thanks, Jason, for having me. It's good to be here. It's been, I appreciate a, it's been it. a few years, but I've, you're doing great work and you've been for a long oh, time. So it's so exciting to catch back up. How are things? Mm -hmm. You had a concert today. Tell us about that. I did. Opera Florum. I'm the artistic director of a company, New Jersey Opera Florum. Um, every season we put on about six musical concerts consisting of a lot of operatic highlights. And today we had a concert dedicated to La Boheme. That's Which a very, a, a kind of a popular title, isn't it? Yes, for <laughs> sure. Everybody loves a bohème. Who doesn't in love some bohème? Capacity. So I felt it was time to bring it back. And why not right now? Winter is upon us. And I think about wintertime and spring when you think about bohème. And it's just great music. You know, something so. about the resonance, you know, of these poor starving artists and uh, their loves and their lives and their losses and then the tragic Correct. loss of BB. At the end, there's something that's just so, their camaraderie, despite all the poverty and their, art, it, it's such a beautiful story. Oh, it's a great story. And it's so relatable for all ages. You know, we have, we have a population that is wide ranging. We're getting a younger population into opera form, but we, we deal with a lot of people that just can't get to the Met physically anymore. You know, we have a lot of senior living that come out. We have people in their 60s and 70s who can get around but don't want to because of COVID and all. So, yeah, it speaks to them for sure. So important that opera in the community is so important these days because not everyone can make it to the big cities, right? And it's so nice exactly. to have a vibrant art scene in people's communities. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah, it's, it's been, we had 179 people, our largest audience in quite a long time, certainly since COVID started. So it was really, oh, it's so great for the singers to get the opportunity to get a standing ovation for 10 minutes, which we had today after they got done. It's Bravissimo. So and you had a wonderful cast. I saw some names on there. Congratulations. And how long have you yes. been in Opera Florum now? I've been artistic director there now, um, I guess it's been about seven or eight years. Stephen DeMeo, who has unfortunately passed um, last year during COVID, was quite a champion of opera at Florham, as well as the Gerda Listener Foundation and some other large um, sort of competition situations in New York City. And a, uh, for a lot of artists, he was a huge supporter. So he put me on the board one week uh, without me knowing it. <laughs> I became a member of the board at Opera Florham. That sounds like He's Steve DeMeo. He ran so many yes. things behind the scenes. <laughs> Great guy. <laughs> A great guy and quite a character. He said, Mary, come to the meeting on Saturday. You're on the board now. And I <laughs> didn't know I was a member of the board. And at the time, there were some other people running the operation, and they since left. And within about a year, I guess about seven years ago, I became artistic and music director of the company. Well, they could not be any more so, lucky to have you at the helm. You're someone oh, who you. has been in the You're opera so scene for so long, and you do such great work, and everybody oh, loves you. you. I, I, we oh, had a shout out from Julia Rowling, who says hello, and she loves Mary Pinto. And oh, it's great I to have some Julia colleagues Rowling. and friends She's here. Thank you. Thank so you, Julia. Did you always know you wanted to be an artist? Yes. Um, pretty much from a young age. My mom had been an opera singer in New York City for quite a long time and um, stopped singing when she had children. But um, I started playing with her help around five years old and started accompanying um, in the classroom with just playing the Pledge of Allegiance in first and second and third grade. I started accompanying, I guess, about second grade. And third grade was my first accompanying concert with the choir. 
And I think from then on, I just loved being with other people and collaborating. And I kind of started, the bug started then. It's such an so, art to be a cl the collaborative pianist. You have to really understand and know people and, and read them so f effortlessly. It's it's really, um, yes. and there hasn't always been like a separate degree track like there is now in today's conservatory system, right? I mean, Right, right. There was not, for sure. And even when John Wissman, who I was honored enough to get a degree with at University of Illinois, at that time, there weren't a ton of master's programs Marty Katz and University of Michigan and John Wisman were sort of the primary programs going on in, in my day, right? And kind of either went, went either place. And now you can get a doctorate at University of Illinois, probably at Michigan too, you know, in a co in collaborative piano, which is amazing. Pretty much anywhere. I know Rutgers offers the doctorate mm -hmm. in collaborative piano. I mean, I think it's become a totally, it's a new world in that regard. Oh my gosh. I encourage more solo pianists to, to grab on and accompany. Um, a little bit. If you like to sight read, if you love to be with people, um, if you love to experience a lot of different genres in a short period of time, you know, musically, it's a great job to have. Did you grow job. up in New Jersey or New York? I grew up in New Jersey in Bergen County in Hohokus, New Jersey. I was there till I was 10. And then we went to Chicago. We moved there when I was about, um, I guess about 10 and a half or so. And I went to a small liberal arts college, DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, and got my uh, bachelor's in piano performance, where my teacher was really hoping that I would continue on a solo path. I won concertos my junior year and played with the orchestra, and she was sort of pushing me in that direction. But I'd always been playing voice lessons, even in college, and really liked, I love singers. I love instrumentalists, and I love singers. I love everything. And in the meantime, my mom had found out about a program John Wilson was running at Eureka College, where Ronald Reagan went. And I did summer programs with him and then ended up at Illinois and got my master's and Illinois has always had a fantastic so, reputation. And there was so many people who were working in the field. It's a great yep. place. Yeah, a lot of people have. Yeah, and I worked with a gentleman, Mark Flint, who was an amazing opera conductor. He was my boss in the opera program. And I was his assistant for three years. And I, I took three years because Mark took me with him to different regional opera companies. And I worked with him as an assistant conductor for about a year on and off and got to work with Susan Graham, who had just won the Met competition that year at Opera Omaha. We did eight, I don't know, probably about two or three months of Romeo and Juliet every day, three school shows a day. Those your artist programs are uh, there's so there's so much singing and performing and, and traveling and yes. doing it again. It's amazing. Oh, my gosh. So much driving and changing clothes in the car. <laughs> I mean, you know, in Chicago for a while, when I was first married and I was working at the Lyric Opera of Chicago Young Artist Program, I would do a cocktail job till a certain amount of time. And I would go to work at Lyric and then have to change my clothes in the parking lot and read you my <laughs> The I don't know glamorous how life of the uh, aspiring artist, uh, the rising <laughs> artist. Yeah. It's so funny. Well, you go through it too, right? You you know, there's so much glamour to what's expected. I've changed in the, the restroom of different places. Yeah, no, I'm still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a gig in in Vero Beach. I was playing for the Debbie Boyd Opera Competition there. And um, I got a flat tire on the way to the gig, and I had to stop at an Exxon station, and I changed into my evening gown in the back of the Exxon station. <laughs> And I got out there, and the guy said to me, boy, you clean up real good. <laughs> what said, happened? <laughs> That's great. Oh, my God. You know, God, you never forget you this. I, I was doing I was doing touring opera for the last five years. I was working for a touring company. I was all over Florida and South Carolina and doing oh. shows. Every night would be in a different, like, six hours away at a different venue. So we'd get there. Oh, my I'd sleep God. in the dressing room, throw my clothes, work with the orchestra, do the show. <laughs> And I mean, sometimes the, the, we'd have we, we'd hit traffic and we'd snag and everything had to be like rushed. So I would get changed in the car and in the car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. it's amazing, isn't it? If people only knew, but it's so gratifying. How lucky do you feel to be able to create art like this and make people feel things when you get to that stage, right? I feel the so, same way working no with singers what, like, and working with other people. I, I love orchestra players. I just love like how each yes. of them needs something different. And it's like, you know, the, the conduct, right. uh, what I love about conducting is that is I like I get to work with so many different types of people from the stage hands to the orchestra, to the singers. Right. And the, you course. know, my goal is to be as helpful as I can is to be as clear as I Correct. can. But, right. 
Well, there's a real, I, I used to say to Mr. Wilson, boy, there should be a psychology degree attached to this program in a way. Because, not because people are insane, but because it takes a lot of understanding about what people need in the, at the time in the room before you start. It's a high stress environment and the best it of is. circumstances, right? I mean, it so. is. I agree. I agree a thousand percent. Add a challenging performance or like, you know, a, a right. production curveball and things get really interesting. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Or getting new music and getting, you know, booked by your agent for a, a new job two days ago that you have to get learned. And so it takes a certain amount of um, not only even only understanding, but a lot of, I think, a lot of patience with yourself and with the artists. And but it's um, amazing. And every day my job is different every, every day because I deal with the kids at Montclair State who are amazing young young artists starting to just blossom and our program has grown so much i'm so proud of where we're headed we have an immersive artist program we're having Wynton marcellus all this week wow. and next come they're doing fantastic things at the cali school and i recommend everybody on this broadcast check out our program if you haven't we have 14 of the most amazing coaches that work at school with us so lucky grant weenus and william hobbs and Michael Caldwell and I mean a lot of just great artists that are there. So, and then you get to, I get to go to the city and deal with people that are dealing with other issues, you know, it's, auditioning for your artist programs and so getting sitting ready at for the new Met office. and learning new roles. So yeah, and then you get the complete, the, the complete roles. career cycle. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, exactly. So not every accompanist wants that kind of diversity. I don't think, but, um, since I am a wife and a mom, um, it's, given me not only just security, but I think it's touched upon a lot of different aspects of life that I find interesting in watching people's journeys, you know? So many singers who, who I've worked with over the years, uh, you know, they, they, they just comment on how, how wonderful a person you are. You know, of course, oh, of course you are, you're you talented that. and you do the job brilliantly, oh, but they always you. say like, she's so nice. And uh, I think that's so important oh, that the people you work with are, you know, understanding and caring. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know if that's always true, but um, I do. I do try to make sure that there's some time to just listen. You know, I love to talk. Obviously, I wouldn't be on the show with you today, but I think I think a lot of times just taking a moment to let them detox. Not a lot of time, but a little time, right? I think it's important to be able to talk. <laughs> Literally, is I think it's vital to to every coach and can't get too deep and can't waste too much energy and time. Just a few minutes. And then tapping into what they really need. I, I'm the kind of coach too that doesn't mind dealing with conducting, you know, rhythms and fixing wrong notes and fixing diction and things like that, which we do a lot of. Obviously, when the singers are younger, you know, and learning how to practice so important that they learn how to prepare a role and practice. I tell my well, students, prepared. that's why you do an undergraduate to learn the proper way to do things, exactly. to get a good kind of reg yeah. regimen, because that, that really lasts right. the rest of your life. Oh, it does, doesn't it? It's amazing, right? Can you remember things you learned when you were fourth, fifth grade, when you were taking lessons and studying? I'm sure you do. I some do things, too. the teachers who really drilled it in, you know, and that some of that mm -hmm. has stuck. Like my undergrad, I had a great teacher when I was, was young and she really drilled the discipline into me. Like that was something that yes. stuck with me and watching her and her discipline, her commitment to her art form inspired me to be the best I could be. And yeah. I, still, I still think about that when I'm backstage, like, okay. Isn't it crazy? She said something to me, oh. uh, heart on fire, head on ice when you perform. And that's wow. always, Love stuck with that. me and I get out there I'm like okay time to put away all the Absolutely. administrivia I do on every job and the booking of this right. and the hiring of that right and it's time to now I've got to be an artist I got to put away right. all that and just produce art exactly well and you are our, and I'd like to say to you you're a joy to play under since I've gotten to do that you're an amazing musician an amazing conductor and you make everybody in that room feel confident and safe and that is a gift that you have been given, and not everybody has that talent, but that is your special gift. Uh, you know, my, I love yeah. people. I, I love like the different types yeah. of people and it's kind evident. of the challenges of that, and kind of you know molding like a group. That's why I like to teach too. Right. I, just, I love you know being around like large groups of people. I, during COVID, it was so hard because you know they took that. Oh we, we all had that taken away from us. So all the ensemble directors yeah. were like drinking wine, and we're like on the Zoom calls together in like a mass therapy yes. session. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. We went for We didn't have it as coaches so much, but 
because I was only dealing with the one-on-one -on -one aspect. So, but even setting up for that and figuring out what was the best plan for the kids and how we were going to get the job done and making recording after recording for them. That was insane. Oh, you must have to do recordings I mean, constantly. Wow. Yeah. I made 72 recordings, I think last semester. <laughs> I mean, it was insane. So I went to, bu I went into business insane. with my son. My son, Quentin's quite a video editor and that type of technology person. Right. We did a hundred virtual ensemble projects. Oh my gosh. That's, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, it was literally insane. We counted them up like that's the craziest thing. And I mean, and some that of them were 80 to 100 people. Some were smaller. Some were much bigger. I right. mean, it was like all summer. We, that's all we did was virtual choir projects and virtual right. orchestra projects. But, you know, you have to feel lucky that you were in a position where you were needed. You know what? I mean, it was a really interesting like, thing because the joy we get out of working with people is why I do it. That's what I love. But um, right. kind of when you when you do it on a Zoom screen, it doesn't have that same immediate impact. You don't feel people's no. like when you when you make a joke and people laugh and you reach the tension and you get back right. to a tough rehearsal. That's all gone. Right. But and you have to do right. shorter rehearsals and kind of um, yeah. you know, it, it, what you of can course. do changes. But the fact that I was able to at least keep my communities together and focused and we Amazing. had great lecturers Amazing. come and talk to people. So that was, you know, right. the community part of it was really stuck with me and how important it was that people maintain a sense of normalcy. Right. I agree. And that's changed the opera world completely. I mean, I think in so, so many ways, right? Obviously, the diversity is one aspect. Definitely necessary that diversity aspect. We'll talk about that. I think we might have even the singers are getting ready for now to present. Everybody's needing an English aria, and I don't mean an English aria. I mean a contemporary aria and a really contemporary aria that I'm seeing on the books all the time now. Got to happen. All the musical theater repertoire that needs to be put in. You know, I've recorded metal lark for a couple of people now that needed it for auditions for, you know, whatever the companies were. There's so many. So that in that respect, I think is fair. Every, but everything's fair game. As long as you are working hard and you've not been sitting on the couch and you're finding your way off of the couch to practicing again and getting ready, I think there are many opportunities that have opened up actually since COVID. It's interesting to watch that, you know, for more diversity in talent. Why don't we and, uh, delve uh, into the uh, the COVID issue? Is, what how, what is something you discovered about yourself during COVID? Um, that I think I found even uh, different, better ways of communicating um, than I had known that I could possibly find. You know, just didn't know they were out there because of the screen situation the trusting of, of the work that you're getting done. Because in the beginning, you think there is no way I'm gonna have any impact on this person, especially when you're dealing with the kids all day at school. Although I develop relationships with people in other countries, certainly that I'm coaching now and I've held on to. But the students in particular that need the regularity, um, didn't know if I could accomplish, get through the screen um, and communicate that to them. So. That slowly but surely started to come back and found my way. Were you a tech? We were you a technology person before COVID? No, not at all. Not at all. Me too. Not at all. Everybody knows that. Yeah, not at all. I'm like tech, nine years old. I'm tech not kryptonite. Me <laughs> too. Right. I mean, terrible. I didn't get email until until at William Patterson and my former job, they sort of forced me to get it, you know, whatever, 12 years ago. I mean, I just wasn't getting an email address. And but now we're, here we now go. you're Zoom coaching people across the globe. Now I'm Zoom coaching in China. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, I mean, I'm not still great at it, but you find your way. You don't really have any choice. I did not get an ether cable. You know, there's some people that did jam Kazam and it got their ether cable hooked up in the house. I didn't go that extreme. And I didn't have to because I wasn't dealing like you are or our choir director at Montclair and all having to deal with ensembles and the, and the choirs and like you. I mean, that, that took extraordinary understanding. You know, it's, it's, even, you know, across the globe, everyone's like, how do we do choir again? And, you know, thankfully yes. it's, come, it's come back and like, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think this has been the, the right. biggest building year in the history, at the least recent history, the last 50 years, 100 years, you know, to rebuild the programs that were put on pause. Oh, oh, ama I mean, amazing. But, you know, you find resources you didn't know existed. I mean, I think that's that's the 
that's the only, I don't want to even say upside, but that's part of the growth, right? Figuring out how you're going to communicate and get to somebody who's sleeping on a bed. I had kids barely out of their bed having to sit up and sing. And so much emotional stuff going on for people, right? So you're, you're battling that a little bit too. The depression, the emotional, the anxiety, the, de- you know, them living at home in their bedroom studying all day. So yeah, it was that a was also drastic shift in life for everybody. And, you know, right. I, I can't tell you how many of our singer colleagues, you know, you know, luckily, I'm, you know, I teach, you teach, th- and thankfully, but, um, you know, all of my, my orchestral players, I mean, oh the, the work God. turned to zero. It was oh, horrific. Terrible. Horrific. I was so lucky. You were really, as I was telling you before, when we were chatting, I never knew I could have an adjunct position. You know, when I got my degree in 87, I didn't know really what that meant with a master's degree and how lucky you feel to be able to, to do that and to be able to do what you love part-time, full-time, whatever you can do. And the other thing is I find people, and I tell the kids all the time, and even my professional singers celebrate getting a gig. I don't care if you're singing at the church down the street and you get to sing two arias on a concert. Let's celebrate it. Kind of celebrate every moment. I think That's we appreciate. Job. I think we've all become much more appreciative of everything. I agree. You know, I was running mm-hmm. around like a lunatic with the year before COVID. I got really busy performing and producing mm-hmm. and doing a lot of uh, other type of. You know, I, I really enjoy the production aspect. That's something I never knew I liked, and COVID yeah. taught me that I couldn't do any of that. So I said, you know, I want to try something different, and then we found out the podcast, and I found I love that too. Yeah. It's something totally different. Which is amazing. And in fact, you're up to 1,600, whatever it is, 1,640. Amazing. Well, I think you know, if, if I did cat videos, I'd probably have 2 million. But so. <laughs> Why are cat videos a thing? I don't understand. You know, cat videos are so big. Cats I, are so big. I, I, what is that? I, I had a cat. I'm like, well, what can we do with this cat? <laughs> That is hilarious. Do you still have a cat now? No, my cat passed away when I was writing my dissert. I was doing my tenure stuff. Oh. We spent that whole year together. When I, I sequestered myself down at Ocean Grove by myself, and I, oh I did all my writing God. for my tenure, and he was with me, and he was probably 18 years old. Oh, and... oh my God. Oh, my God. We got did he some... survive through your dissertation? He did. Did you he survive? Did. Did he, he, did. Survive? he made it all the way until oh December, God. and I got tenure, and uh, poor thing. But, um, yeah, he was on my family. Oh. My son, when we lived in Summit, he just showed up on our doorstep, and my, my, my son was three at the time, who's now 22. And he's like, can we keep him, Dad? Wow. And we kept him, and he just became part of the family, as they do. That's crazy. Yeah, the cats are, I mean, cats are a real thing. Cats and videos and... <laughs> Crazy. We got some love in the from the audience. Gabriel Baseman says he misses you and he's so excited oh, you're here. I miss you too, Gabe. Thank you so much. I miss you as well. Another Montclair you, guy. And I saw him yes, before he went to Montclair and then I just saw him recently. So it's great to see some Did you? friends out in there. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah, he's fantastic. And so such an intelligent guy. He's got so much going on. I don't know what he's doing now, but dying to know. I heard he was you know, I'll, I'll say a few words. So I'll, talk about him for a second uh, i know he's doing a lot of live streaming and uh, he's become he like a, t- a tech genius a tech, in addition to his guy. music mm-hmm. that's fantastic so shout it's out. so great so helpful to, to know about this end of the business oh and i think God. he told me I, I just had a meeting with him recently that he had done this before covid so by the time covid hit he was like ready to go he had the, all the skill sets ready to be you know it's like wow. the, the live streaming became everything because you know we, everything I mean, oh. that's all there was was, was zoom oh and live God. streaming yeah it's, i mean it's it's so rewarding to be able to go play live music you know opera form stayed solvent all through covid and we were so lucky to be able to to do that with masking and temperature checking at the door and everything but Joan Del Giudice, our force of nature, who's the president, just kept going, you know. Well, she just kept going and saying, I need another program, I need another program. And One but, thing that we know about humans and artists is that we are malleable, that we are a resilient bunch, are. and that people need the people art more matters. than ever in difficult times. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree, and it's so healing. I've had many people in my living room, many artists, in fact, cry, you know, kind of weepy when they started singing again. It was amazing. We were all many a, people. We were all a little rusty in our own way. We had to kind of get the rust I off. I agree. And, I mean, <laughs> and, the, and the visceral reaction to it was amazing. The sound, 
just having a sound underneath them and them making sound incredible. You know, I've been emotional be so many cool. times since COVID. I had my first choir mm -hmm. rehearsals in, in uh, June at Ocean Grove and had 40 singers in front of me and I just lost it during the first round. Mm -hmm. My hands were going in the wrong directions wow. every time I was conducting. <laughs> I don't know what wow. my hands were doing, but I was just in tears. I, heard, I hit a big C oh. major chord, we tuned it up and I just stopped. I just had to stop. And, and that was it. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Oh. I had it too. I mean, how can you not be affected by that? You know, you'd be crazy not to be. Because just the sound, the vibration, right? Gets that's that's what I love about collaborative work is that you are part of making sound is, and also playing operatic reductions for that same reason too. I've always, I always, I grew up playing TV show themes while I was learning to play Bach and Mozart. You know, I wanted to recreate sound that I'd heard from a young age. I love that, and that's what I even find that poem score today it's so gratifying those are the, the orchestra reductions are so challenging they're not always pianistic mm -hmm. per se so it's right. really interesting to play all those really challenging like the beginning of bohem boy <laughs> yeah that's nasty and they all have nasty parts i don't think there's anything anything that's pianistic in those reductions a, a lot of times there are things that feel great and there are things that feel horrible you know and that's the other challenge about this job that i love you have to work on sometimes on the quick when you're sight reading, especially and reduce quickly. So, you know, that part of the job I find fascinating. Maybe not everybody would because you have to. I had to sight read a piece when my mom practiced with me every day from the age of five till about probably 11 or 12. Um, and she took notes at the piano lessons, too. But I had to sight read a, a page of music every day from my lessons when I was little. And I wasn't allowed to go back and fix anything. It was wow. so interesting. I never met anybody that learned, that was taught how to sight read, you know, and I'm not the greatest sight reader there is out there for sure, but it's such a, it's a great skill for all musicians to be a part of. I don't care what age you are, you know, taking a page and not being allowed to correct anything and just whatever it is, it is the next day, take another page, you know, but it's, it's really informed. I think a lot of, things about sight reading as an accompanist in a lesson, you know. How do you think that the the, the challenges we all face in COVID, how do you think that they, they, they're going to manifest themselves moving forward in the opera industry and the vocal industry? And what are some things we've learned? I think a lot of people have learned they can't take their careers for granted. And I think they're, and that nothing is, um, nothing should be expected without work. I think even the scope of the artists we're going to see coming to the Met and to, to regional houses is going to be um, quite, I'm, I'm hoping, more diversity ethnically as well as vocally. You know, there are, you might see the, some of the same artists coming up at the Met all the time. I think there is a wave of change within that, that there's going to be more variety of people that are going to get through that door. And because people have spent time working on their craft, that, you know, that's in true. a way that's been very specific and detail oriented. And I think that to me is the most exciting thing to see. Um, not just because I coach people that are hopefully going to be working, but just because it means there's a larger um, variety of artists that are, that are going to be seen for the diversity that they possess artistically and musically and, you know, um, so I think, I think in that sense, it's going to change the scope and things are coming back. I've talked to a couple of managers in the business and work is here. No, I, and that's, I, I'm booking orchestras. I, I'm booking four orchestras the next two months and actually six orchestras it's fantastic. and people yes. are working. I mean, everyone's busy, but we're all, yes. we're starting to make up for lost people times. Are things are a little I different, agree. but it's not bad. Yes. Yeah. And I think repertoire is changing as you probably know that too. I mean, you know that as well, I'm sure. I think the size but of the orchestras the... are getting a little bit smaller, the size of the Correct. repertoire. People are being a little more f fiscally conservative. I agree with you. Financially, you have to be more careful. That's why I'm encouraging most of my artists to make sure they have something new on that package that might be coming from a one-act, you know, opera. So because I think those those jobs are going to be coming about pretty. And I just had somebody audition for a Brazilian opera company in New York City. I didn't even know this existed. Cool. He's a countertenor. And how wonderful is that? And they and they asked him if he did drag. 
which I think is also fantastic. So the possibilities are endless and he has done some and how great is that? He sings beautifully and he's able to, you know, transpose himself and into all these, all these different places. I love hearing about those stories. We that had a composer so- on the show a couple of couple of weeks ago, Felix Giroir, who wrote a drag opera. So. Oh, yes. Oh, I know, Felix. Yeah. <laughs> it's Amazing. a small world in our field, so we all know each other. It really is. So that those kind of niche places, in even in New York City, like this Brazilian, and it might have been around for a long time, and excuse me if it hasn't, I didn't know anything about it. I feel badly saying that, but... You know, that's not one that had popped up before, but I see a lot of companies coming up on the Yap Tracker auditions people are getting called in for that were not a thing before. Or they were a smaller thing or but they're getting to be a bigger thing now. You know, we're seeing because, we're seeing some really high level like indie like like I have a lot of indie artists on the show and some of these indie artists have huge, yeah. I mean huge followings. They've built it organically right. and they do it slowly it's over time. And I think that there's oh my God. you know, we're, we're we're no one can outmet the met in terms of production skill, but people I are agree. being very creative doing really interesting stagings yeah. and in oh my God, smaller in, so- intimate venues. Exactly. And video streaming, like Curtis just did a production, a video stream production this weekend that was showed at a, I don't know what kind of film festival it was. I'm not, I don't have the details of that, but I had some people that I have worked with in the past or one person that was part of that. I mean, it's amazing. You know, the technology like you're having at Seton Hall with the Don Giovanni, you know, with the, and I was part of the Morelia Festival this summer, which was amazing, the International um, Opera Festival of Morelia in Mexico. And they did an amazing job having an orchestra be there for the gala and to put on a Marriage of Figaro, which is a very innovative um, production. And I got to do a scenes program. I got to direct this summer, which was also Oh, my amazing. God. I didn't know that you were directing. What That's was it like to direct? Oh, I thought it was amazingly um, fun. And as a pianist, getting to direct um, on my own rather than watching a director direct and having be in a different position – very interesting multitasking from jumping up from the piano and staging and then going back to the piano and but so in, so in, interesting and engaging and fun i got to shop for my own props at the Woolworths in morelia because there wasn't much to shop for i did you know it was limited i bought a spanish monopoly game because then don pasquale and the duet they, sure. they took a picnic down and, and played some monopoly and so we tried to find some innovative things to throw in the mix you know but yeah, it was just, again, they didn't have a director to come to it. They weren't going to probably fund that when they had a gala and a four performances of, of Figaro that Jorge Parodi, who's a brilliant conductor, conducted. So I was kind of left to my own devices, but super fun. So that kind of thing probably would never have happened before COVID, you know. It's it always great to be expanding your skill set. That's one thing, uh, you know, in the music Correct. field, I tell my students, it's uh, the music field is a is a long distance marathon. If you go into this business, oh, not a sprint. Is. You're always it learning. Is, no, it isn't it that the God's honest truth. I think about that often. I'm sure you do too. When you think my bet, some of the best years and most fun are still ahead. I believe that. Me too. You know, there's more fun to be had, and I also think that. The enjoyment in this business is coming back. I do think that the people that are not there to enjoy the process with you and to learn from each other and have a collaborative experience, those people are not going to be part of the mix it, anymore. I don't I know if you see that. See that. that. I think that it's going to be a... If you ask me about the business, that to me is I think it's it. streamlined. I think it's very young right now. I think uh, there's a lot of room for young people yep. coming up who are prepared and ready to go. Oh, definitely. I think we've lost... A, pers- a part of many of the older artists, I think, have retired in some ways. Not, I'm not. I've seen some come back, but it's a real challenge in that regard. Right, right. Oh, for sure. But I think it's you know that's really exciting because uh, that puts a new energy. And you know what I love about opera and classical music is every generation puts their own stamp on it anyway. So maybe this oh, is the, what we I we've agree. all needed. We've needed change. We've needed to shift the paradigm a bit to oh. to move things around. Oh, I agree. For sure, we did a whole, Karen Driscoll, one of the professors at Montclair, ingeniously did a whole scenes program last spring, all on video. Brilliant. And I mean, it was May outside, at school. It was incredible. And the kids were amazing. Oh my God, it was so beautifully shot. And 
you know, so gratifying. We're doing a marriage of Figaro at school this spring. Jeffrey Gall, our opera director, will be directing it. And, and that's going to be, I'm sure, very innovative. And the things that younger singers have to bring to the table, so interesting, right? So in, with their understanding of social media alone is amazing. Yeah, I always say yeah. that opera is all about universal human themes. And, um, yes. you know, I'm doing two two productions coming up. I'm this Don Giovanni tomorrow. It's a semi-staged concert. And we've made it like right. a Me Too statement. It's a whole thing about, um, oh, you know, we're using, so we took out the psychoresset and we've added monologues, pre-recorded monologues, and there's projected oh, film mapping so throughout. Funny. I mean, because I don't want to do a concert, just get on there and do a concert and sing it, people. I wanted to tell the story and tell it in a modern right. way. And that's going right. to grab young people and have them come back to opera. I agree completely. I agree. That's that's what my hope is for Opera at Florham too. Is that we are headed towards? We're having our 40th anniversary gala. So exciting! Fall. 40 years. That's you yeah, know, exciting. Any company that survives like that, you know, you have to applaud. So congratulations Amazing. to you and Joan Del Jay and and to all Joan. the crew. Oh, especially. Yeah, amazing. And I'm I'm think we're going to have a benefactor be able to fund an or orchestra concert. And I'm so excited to be able to move towards that, which is my goal towards orchestra and scenes program and eventually full stage opera again to get back to that. And boy, you know, anything you can get done is right now is, is a blessing. And I think people are willing to help. I do think people are willing to help if you ask, you know, not everybody can. You put the net out there, and you know what? Absolutely. People do see the value. You know, when you do a concert like you did mm -hmm. today, and people, you know, just they're moved by the music. Oh that's a special thing. We need more of that in our oh. lives. Oh yeah, we do a thousand percent. So I think, yeah, I think that's all true, and I think just the scope of the business is is going to reflect that in a lot of ways, in seeing what I'm seeing. But they had fourteen hundred people apply for the Met auditions this year for the prelude. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it's, you, it's amazing. And, um, you know, that's the big house. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. 1,400 applicants for the preliminary round. I mean, it's, it's just undaunting. But yet, you know, good for, good for them. Good for people. It's all, I mean, it's all good. And, so, and I also see a lot more competitions that have come up since COVID. I'm sure you probably have too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's exciting to see the opportunities return. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree. I'm excited to see what comes up and see what the productions that come out. I know I've been yes. working, I'm working with a number of different companies and they're producing and they're planning right. and they're they're planning which long term, which is exciting and healthy. Really, really, really exciting. Um, uh, have you been to the Met this season yet at all? Not yet. I, I, I saw the dress rehearsal of Fire yeah. Shut My Bones, the Terry Blanchard show. That was really cool. I, I have a lot of friends. It's oh. hard for me to get to the shows. I go to more of the dress rehearsals and I sneak in and sneak out. <laughs> it's like. Right, right. Me too. I just don't have, I don't have the time or the opportunity. You know, it's like, and, yeah, uh, be, I, I'm, I'm so, a dad too. So between my, my kids and between my right, running around doing right. a lot of work. And I just started with Light Opera of right. the Jersey, which has been taking up a lot of my time in a wonderful which way. Is amazing that you're the artistic or music director there. It's so great. They're so lucky to have you. Yeah. And I love that company. You know, it's it's great. Feeling Once again, I love community music making. I think that, oh. I think there's a big void there, like where we can do some interesting things and oh bring Oh my up, God, I came, out of, I came out of the concert today and there must have been 50 older people with walkers waiting for the bus to pick them up. Oh, my God. So happy. You know, reaching out their hand to shake it. I mean, it was crazy. How gratifying it. is that, right? That's I amazing. That. Well, you know, I love hearing that. We move people. And that, that's great. People need art in their lives lucky. from cradle We're to the so grave. Lucky. Oh, I agree with you. I want to, I tell people all the time, look, I'm going to be in the slippers with the red lipstick that's a little bit off center and a huge hair still, or maybe a wig in the old people's home running the sing-along. And you better take care of me and bring over the lipstick when I'm out of it. Because I am expecting, God willing, that I'll be still doing something, you know? It's amazing. That people will show up. How do you, you know? balance um, being a mom and being a, being an artist? And, that, you know, I know for me that's always been a challenge is balancing personal oh, yeah. and professional. How did you manage that to achieve that balance? Um, I've, I mean, I'm, I am very blessed with an incredibly, incredibly supportive husband. Mitchell's been amazing our entire marriage about me working. I'm so, so lucky. And on top of it, I have two very independent um, children who have been Brittany and Sam, who've been also amazing and very tolerant. It's not easy having a mom that works these hours in addition to just working, working nighttime hours, working day and night, 
So I think I was just incredibly blessed. And also from a young age, unfortunately, or fortunately for my sake, they were, they were used to it. You know, interestingly enough, though, at a young age, my daughter said, I will never become a singer <laughs> because there's just, there's so much going on in that living room that I can't even imagine you having to. Uh, out of my four, three, uh, three of my children are all, they're all, all four musical. They're all artistic. They all do different artistic That's things. Amazing. But the first three didn't want to do music as a career. They saw my life. They're like, you know what? I'm going to do something else. Right. My youngest one wants right. to, he's a fusion jazz rock drummer and he's really going to go into that. But, uh, which is, which is fantastic. And, I, and my daughter is a TV producer in Kansas City now. She just got a job there. It's, there's it's definitely amazing. art in that, of course. Yeah. Yep. And my son is artistic and loves to draw. And, I, you know, we'll yet to be seen where that all It makes, it makes sense because I know your husband's also an author. He is. He's an amazing writer and an author and a publisher of public safety magazines and has written several um best-selling novels and i mean an amazing writer an amazing artist and creator and so lucky so it makes sense that um, you have very talented and interesting kids so that's awesome yeah i i definitely am very very blessed and very understanding um incredibly tolerant what advice do you have for young artists coming up in the business today as a companist or a singer or, or both coaches <laughs> both well, I would say as a collaborative pianist, learn to sight read. Learn to sight read at a young age. So it becomes not scary. Really, really the most important skill, I think, that I could um, that I could mention is to learn to sight read and sight read every day when you're practicing. I think as a coach accompanist, um, making sure that you spend as much time working on your language study as possible coming up um, in high school. If you have any interest in doing this, you may not even know that in high school, but if you love playing for a singer, even if it's a church, start working on your languages and becoming really knowledgeable about that. So important and so helpful. And um, as, a, as a singer, again, learning the craft of learning to learn your music and sight reading and learning to play the piano is the most important skill that you could give yourself a gift of getting piano lessons. And it's never too late to start learning how to play, even if it's in college. You know, it does not matter when. That's the one thing you have to always remember. There's never a good time sometimes to fit these things in your life, right? But there's never a bad time either. So even if you get started on the later side with learning to play and being able to learn your music well, it's all good. And it will make the process of getting out there and working so much better. And making sure also that you advocate for yourself all of the time. It does not always mean that the most successful artist is the best singer. It's the people that self-advocate and are unabashed about, about promotion within, within reason and having an understanding of what's appropriate. And asking for help, really important you know, and a team, team building as an opera singer to have a huge career, the most important thing at a higher level, yeah, you have your team. So many different I, artists, how important I, it is to have a supportive team, the ears, the coach, correct. the ears, the teacher, um, right. supportive the conductors, language, the language everything. only person. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And I think that is something as a young artist, you don't always realize. And also having the money and having some stability in your life financially um, that it will allow you to be able to pay for the coachings, pay for the diction coachings, pay for the lessons, all of that. The audience doesn't you know? see that part of the business, do they? They don't see that. No. How enormous. It's 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 a very time-intensive business. You have to always be prepared. It really is. It really is. And, you know, those people that are most successful have found a way to keep a job and also schedule their lives so they can you know, promote, promote themselves in their business too. Well, thank you for sharing. You know, and no That's such great, small. it's great um, artistic advice for people coming up because, uh, I hope. you know, we, we, we have to pass on that knowledge to the next generation people who are coming up. And uh, I just love how many oh, people yeah. reach out to me on the show and, you know, reach out about the artists who are the guests like yourself. Oh my God. There's so much we can learn from each other. And you, and you have brought such a wonderful platform for all of us to be able to be, I mean, what a gift to be able to come on and, 
and and you know communicate with you but you've brought so much variety of business and music into the industry that's, that you're putting out on this platform which is fantastic I just love the having these conversations because, you know, yeah. during COVID, I was just amazed. I, first, of all, I missed my colleagues so much. I mean, I was supposed right. to be doing gig, my debut in Vienna, my debut in Prague with the orchestras. And wow. I was devastated when all that fell through. I'm like, okay, whatever. Back to work again. I did land. I did, but worked on my backyard. So, okay, after about a month, I'm like, backyard's in good shape. Now I need to be yeah. creative again. <laughs> And um, this this is kind of my, my my exploration was to reach out to friends and I was terrible at it at first I really was bad at it but um, oh but it's just reaching out to friends and talking and learning and like how how are how right. are you getting by and, right. and how I was are you so doing? amazed with yeah. how innovative people were oh my God it's amazing and you've done this for a long time how many months have you been doing the show uh, we started in June of last year okay. Yeah, the variety of opera singers and artists you've had on here, amazing. And I'm honored that you asked a collaborative pianist such as myself and Coach to be on, because very rarely does that aspect of the business get brought into the brought into the picture, I, I think. People not, don't realize I'm, how important and pivotal those roles are, because without people like yourself who prepare the people for the next yeah. round of concerts and traveling, I mean, I right. mean, in the in our business, right. we know that you can't have it without, it. you know, you absolutely need good right. pianists around. Oh, it's like essential. It's like water for an opera company. But, um, right. but the audience doesn't always right. see that. And um, I just know how good you are. So Correct. I couldn't wait to talk to you. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, and I think also... I, I want to also say to people that do this job, there's so much variety of business that you can do. You can be a house pianist. You can be doing auditions in the city. You can work at a college level. You know, I want people to know that there's so much joy in this job because there's so much variety of places you can be, you know, in the house, not in a house, in the pit for hours all day, you know, and it's all interesting. I was pregnant with Brittany during turn at Dallas eight months and i was in front of the gongs oh. for the show <laughs> wow I was months, and i'm a little gal if you know me so i i i look like the nutty professor in eddie murphy's movie that's how i kind of went through the pregnancy with britney was all in the front and graham jenkins at the time put me in the pit and i was i was in um yeah, i was or it wasn't graham it was an italian conductor he said i'm going to put you right in front of the percussion <laughs> and oh my god and there's a lot of percussion in that score. <laughs> there is so much percussion in turn. Do you ever survive that? Amazing. And some of this guy, you know, the guys are very casual and say, wow, we hit that gong. We see something poking up. And by that time, their feet are, you know, her feet are poking up against your belly because for eight months, and it was noisy. It was pretty darn funny. And what a great job to have, you know, like crazy. You have to be airlifted into the pit when you're playing at eight months, when you're five <laughs> four, you know, literally airlifted. I love They'd it. They have to make space for me to get behind the keyboard. I was on an electric keyboard. It was crazy. These are the memories you a, never forget. The, those are the, the memories the stories. During, yeah, during pregnancy that you don't ever forget, having those gongs go off. It's amazing how again, life happens around the art and then just kind of. It really does. You know, how lucky I was to have a job, you know, to go play the piano somewhere. And being pregnant and enormous, eating eating constantly, it's hilarious. And turned out of all things, such a quiet orchestration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Eight months too, it was amazing. Mira. So after that, after I left Dallas and went to San Antonio Opera for a while, then we moved to Jersey, and I got out of the got out of the pit business, you know, which I loved. But um, I mean, I've done, I mean, I did I did the show with you, of course. We did Barber, right? Did we oh, do we did yeah, Barbieri. We did Barbieri, and you were. Like the, that's yeah. You know, there's so much yeah, so harpsichord fun. and cembalo and oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. To do all the rests. That was a great show. What oh. a, what a fun cast. I had oh, um, I had great cast. I had uh, the guy from Curtis. What's the conductor's name? Uh, uh Chris Macatsoris came, and he's oh. like. He was just like, the cast was fantastic. And I had uh, Brad Moore's like, that was the best no-name cast I've ever seen of that show. Wow. <laughs> like, oh. They said that about our Barber of Seville yeah, we did? they both came. Yeah. New Jersey? Well, it was a, it was a great and cast. And they were fantastic. We were like, now they're all working. They're all, they're all over the place. They're all working. <laughs> I think Luigi's retired, but I think everybody else yeah. is working a lot. I know Steffi Loricello yeah. is singing. She just had a child. I saw that. Yeah, she's working. Yeah. On, she's working everywhere. And Stefano Di Peppo. He's been working everywhere ever since. <laughs> everywhere. 
how and how fantastic is that to what a lot and he's doing so much linguist work he just reached know? out to me today i gotta have him on the show that reminds me i just haven't asked him yet he, he, he's yeah, so he's interesting he's an interesting guy he's fantastic and his life story and the career this he's one of the had, funniest he, singers on the stage too he's so funny oh my <laughs> god he is amazing and he's so generous of spirit you know he offered to help me with the singer's work on diction for this show today, and I didn't have the time. The singers are all so busy with auditions right now that even getting together for a rehearsal, which we had Friday night for two hours, was very tricky to organize. But I said, next time. And how nice. How lovely yeah. is that? You know? A real He's great. Well, He's yeah, great. we're in a business with a lot of great people. That's one thing I love about what I do is like, you know, when I put together oh teams, God. I get to choose who I work yes. with. And I, I choose to work with people who oh, are supportive great. and good oh. people. Oh, great. And your affiliation with uh, our friend Maria Zoy at Atelier de Excellence. You know, Amazing. you came up in the conversation. We were on the, I guess it was before the air. We were just talking. Uh, it was me, Ricardo, uh, Estrada, and Maria, and before the guests came on. And Ricardo was saying, he, it was funny, I, he didn't know I knew you. And he's like, yeah, I've gotten this lovely coach from America who is so nice, Mary Pinto. I'm like, <laughs> I love that. It's so oh, cool. my God. Crazy, right? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I'd sent I'd sent a lot of singers to him, and he's he's, he's you know he's struggling right now to yeah to, um, so poor guy with a lot of illness. Bless his heart. I'm we're all praying. We're all for praying him. for him. Yeah. An amazing care, an amazing coach. It was two days amazing. after that interview, and he's like such a vibrant person, and so it know. was two days later. <laughs> oh my God! So you saw you were all on that interview on Sunday. Together? Yeah, it was uh, Hui He was the, the soprano, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was. Um, was he done? The, he done that Caballé competition right. with some singers I that were that I coached that were in, and um, I know. Shout out to Molly Dunn, Dunn who's going to be in a production of doing. Yes, she sang with you oh, today. I heard she was spectacular. Amazing. She was spectacular, and she's such an amazing artist. And Gina Hans, like who's doing your That's Rosetta, right. is an amazing singer too. So excited for them! Can't wait to do the Bohem with you. It's and Jeremy Bronner, who's a Montclair grad, is your tenor. I mean, I could not be more proud of. Yeah, it's just you know, Jersey's got some good singers. You know, some good singers out there. We have great singers in the Garden State. That's what my my focus in opera form is certainly to bring. I'm trying at least to get New Jersey. Well, you're doing a great job bringing artists from all over Thank the region you. to the best. You know, it's bringing the best of the art to the local communities. And I think that is so important. And there's such a need for that today in opera because we've lost so yes. many of the regional companies in throughout the country, we really. We have, we have, and, and that's what I hope to be someday right now. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. You're hopefully. doing it, you're doing it, and you're doing it again. They're lucky to have you there because you are oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, it was so good to talk to you. Thank Where you so much. Where can people much. go to find out more about you? Um, I do not have a website, but I'm about to get one. So I'm working with my girlfriend who I um, coach who also does web design. So stay tuned. In the next three or four months, I should have something up and uh, they can learn more about me. But um, you can also go to the Montclair website right now. My bio is there with my email Perfect. and my information. If you want to ever find me for coaching or contact me about the business or you know, if you have a if you have a youngster that's interested in collaborative piano work, I would love to talk to them. I even teach collaborative piano as well. Well, I do some. I can't work. imagine a better teacher. So make sure you find this artist and reach out because oh, you'll you'll be happy you did. Thank you, Jason, for everything. You're fantastic, and best of luck to you well, tomorrow. Look forward to and catch up with you the and uh, down the road in and person. continued Yay. success. No, so nice. And thank you, Quentin, for doing all you're doing for all of us. Quentin's the wizard behind the scenes of Music Matters. I know he is. <laughs> thank, thank you for making this happen. It was great to see you again. Well, I look too. forward to seeing you in person down the road, and, and I'll see you. Me too. We'll talk soon. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters with Jason Tran. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube. Also, follow us at other places. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can follow Music Matters as an as a audio-only podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everything in between. So thank you so much for joining us. And remember, keep music alive. <laughs>